Welcome to the show. I'm Karen Crozier. In Matthew 5, 9, Jesus states, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Jesus does not identify the individuals or groups who engage in resolving conflict and transforming violence. Instead, he merely affirms their existence and ensures them of their divine kinship in his teaching on the mount. Both then and today, we live in a world riddled with violence and conflict. This year marks the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's Jr. March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, in which he addressed the racial and economic violence and injustice in the U.S. A Christian minister committed to the way of peace and nonviolence, King modeled for Christians and the nation an alternative response to violence and injustice. Yet, today, who and where are the concrete examples of Christian peacemakers? How does contemporary Christian peacemaking speak to the conflict and violence within and beyond our religious and social institutions? Today, joining us to address these pivotal questions is Dr. Terry Brinsinger, Dean of the Seminary and Vice President at Fresno Pacific University and author of Focusing Our Faith, Brethren in Christ, Core Values. Welcome to the show, Thank Dr. Brinson. Thank you, My pleasure. When we look at the role that Dr. King had in both the nation and the world, as well as the church, mm -hmm. and the way that he modeled for people nonviolence and peacemaking, can you share of your experience of how you have encountered King's influence in your ministry and leadership? Sure. I was a kid, of course, when all of this, uh, when, when, when Martin Luther King and his work came to the forefront. So I was impressed more by pictures than mm -hmm. propositions, by images. And hearing him uh, and watching him with such passion, such courage, uh, to stand up for something that he believed in uh, stayed with me. I mean, to this day, mm -hmm. I've, I've read and... I've watched his speech in Lincoln Memorial, I don't know how many times. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, um, it's his passion, his courage, his principle, I think was just captivating to the seven-year-old that I was uh, when I first encountered him. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the passion and courage, many people may not know, what is peacemaking? Uh, you come from a tradition of Brethren in Christ, of Anabaptists, who has that as a part of your core identity right. of peacemaking. So for our viewers who may be struggling with, what does peacemaking entail that includes yeah. the passion and the courage and beyond? How would you define peacemaking? Well, yeah, let me just say before that, that I, I wasn't raised in that tradition. Mm -hmm. I, I came into it by virtue of my own journey, and peacemaking was a big part of that. I mean, mm -hmm. I was raised, my dad was a tank sergeant in World War II. It was... Peacemaking was not common to me. Mm. Uh, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peaceful. Mm -hmm. you know, we often talk about being peaceful, having inner peace, mm -hmm. some kind of solitude, but peacemakers are those who actively engage in breaking down walls and building bridges between people for whatever reasons divide them and put that into action, to creative action in every way and at every level that they can. Mm -hmm. And so who were some of your models or mentors who were able to break down those walls and to bring different communities together who were at odds with one another um, that really helped you to find a concrete understanding mm -hmm. of peacemaking? The first was my advisor in undergraduate school. I went to college, again, completely unfamiliar with this peacemaking tradition and majored in religion and the, the chair of the department was my advisor, took me under his wing, and this guy was peacemaking incarnate, I mean, in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Even the way he tr treated us as students, you know, the respect he had mm -hmm. for us. And I watched that model just lived out in, in every area of his life. So he's the guy that really got me thinking about this, that this isn't simply an idea to hold, but a life to be embraced. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second was, he's actually, his name is Dennis Madden. He's a priest in the Archdiocese of Baltimore now. Mm -hmm. But he was uh, living in Jerusalem when I was on sabbatical there a few times. 
and um, just the constant. He went around as a mediator all over the world into some of the most conflicted areas, and I met with him uh, one on one for a year, just each week, and um, you know, he'd share some of his stories, illustrations, mm -hmm. principles. Uh, just profoundly helpful. Any others that you care to mention who were monumental um, as well that helped shape your understanding in the church? Because you talked about him in the classroom and, and the ways that you experienced yourself as a, as a student. And as far as pastoral leadership, were there any pastors or others who shared as models? Yeah, the associate pastor of our church when I was in college his name is Merle Brubaker, was another one of those mm -hmm. uh, guys who just oozed with this, mm -hmm. this uh, welcoming you into his world, building bridges, connecting, mm -hmm. making you feel at ease. And I watched him do it even as an undergraduate in some conflicted situations on campus with people that were <coughs> fussing, fighting, and, uh, and all of that. So he was strategic. And I, in, in my own sort of a way, um, I didn't know it at the time, but my mother, I think, influenced me in some of these ways. And, and her, her influence was as much out of personality as it was theology. I mean, she didn't read a lot of books. She couldn't share quotes about peacemaking and all of that. But her whole approach to life was to, to welcome and embrace people to, uh, I mean, used to make me angry sometimes because she was so good at I'm, I, I, I'm not a peacemaker just by disposition but by conviction where she just kind of naturally flowed and built relationships with all kinds of people that other people might have found I guess difficult to deal with so in a, in a sort of a way even when I was little I guess I watched that in ways that I came to appreciate later on the way that she even dealt with people so peacemaking has to do, if I'm understanding correctly, with the personality, the passion, as well as the way that people are able to welcome others into their worlds with being vulnerable and open and bringing those two worlds together, uh, otherwise that have remained alienated or disconnected. Would yeah. that be a fair? Yeah, and I think it, it affects every area of life. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I uh, respond to my, my wife, my children, my students. I think it's unfortunate to conclude that peacemaking only takes place in these, you know, global catastrophic situations. My suspicion is if we took it serious, seriously at personal and local levels, that would inevitably influence the way we deal with larger issues as well. So if we're truly committed to making peace, then that affects every relationship that we're involved in not just our views of, of war, as important that is, but how we treat our neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, how we respond to the cashier at the grocery store on a bad day. Uh, all of those kinds of things are related. It's a view or a way of life, not just a way of responding to isolated situations. Right, so it is both private and public spaces and not so much the way that we look at it only in the public or global events, but in our everyday living experience, how are we responding to right. tr loving our neighbor and seeing our enemy as our potential neighbor? Yeah, as an illustration, there was a, there was a uh, march against uh, the war in, in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and during the middle of the march, uh, this was, uh, you know, in the 60s, uh, there were some hecklers on the sidewalk you know, mocking some of the participants in the march, and a couple guys left the march, went out and beat up the hecklers. <laughs> well, I mean, how, how can you march for peace in a global sense and treat other individuals right beside you with such disregard? I mean, it was a complete, I don't know, complete misunderstanding or a, a lack of commitment to peacemaking in its broadest sense. Mm -hmm. What has, in light of that, you share of that negative experience, what has been one of your most positive or memorable experience concerning peacemaking? Well, my most memorable experience was uh, after 9-11 and when President Bush at the time was weighing the options of invading Iraq. Uh, I was asked to 
to preach on the steps of the Capitol in Pennsylvania, the state Capitol. And that was certainly the most memorable experience because, as you might imagine, there were people of all different points of view. Uh, the air was heavy, a lot of anxiety, all of that kind of stuff. So that was clearly the most memorable. I mean, I've had other examples that were more satisfying in, in, the, in terms of seeing results and that kind of stuff. But um, that was clearly the most, the most memorable. And do you care to elaborate on those that were more, more satisfying, in your opinion? I think one of the most satisfying, uh, as simple as it sounds, was that there were two pastors in my tradition and their spouses who hadn't spoken together for years, uh, could barely be in the same room. And I approached each of them individually, each couple individually, and said, this shouldn't be. Uh, can, I, can I be involved in helping you work through this? And I guess to my delight and surprise, they both agreed. And so after a rather long process, watching them embrace each other was a, was a really powerful thing. And there are plenty of examples of that, but that's a fairly simple one that has really stayed with me. Yes, and you have provided us with some very concrete examples at both uh, personally and locally and within our church settings of how we can be peacemakers. Is there anything you would like to share as far as how Christians can become more nurtured and encouraged to take those risks of courage and uh, to be the peacemakers both in both public and private places? Yeah, I, I like the word imagination. Mm -hmm. Imagination is the ability, in a sense, to, to see what could be mm -hmm. when you're looking at what is. Mm -hmm. And so I teach a couple of courses related to, to peacemaking and church stuff, ecclesiology and that. And my simplest invitation to people is to begin using some of their creativity and imagination to think about peacemaking initiatives and activities. Um, we just have bought into the system that what's, what happens every day is what's normal. You, know, you hit me, I hit you. You take from me, I, it's just a normal part of life. It's the way we respond as individuals. It's the way countries respond to each other. If we attack, attack you, you attack us, all of that. And I can't help but wonder if, if like church boards, or we used to have family meetings in my house so that we could, we could teach our kids peacemaking strategies. If we took it seriously, didn't think it was just naive, used our imagination, sat around together thinking, now what could we do in this volatile situation that would disarm people figuratively I'm gonna have to and get them thinking? That's yes. what I'd like to see them do. Well, great. Well, thank you for that very insightful uh, articulation of how we can be peacemakers. At this time, we will have to take a break, and we'll be back to continue our conversation on peacemaking. Please stay tuned. KNXC thanks all its loyal viewers and respected businesses who have supported your Catholic television station. Now you can support KNXT with program underwriting by having your name, your company's name, or organization associated with your favorite program. Detailed information about you or your company will appear before and after each program or day part you select. Keep the quality and spiritual message alive and make a difference. Call 559-488-7440 today or go online at knxt.tv to find out more about program underwriting on KNXT. Welcome back to Perspectives on Faith and Culture. Our topic today is peacemaking, and we're focusing on contemporary Christian peacemakers in light of the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., now 50 years following the monumental march on Washington. I'm joined again by Dr. Terry Brinsinger, author and seminary dean and vice president at Fresno Pacific University. Also, joining for this segment of the program is Reverend Dr. Floyd Harris, Jr., Assistant Pastor of New Light for New Life Church of God in Fresno and founder of the National Network in Action. Thank you for joining. 
Fannie Lou Hamer is one who as well was very prominent in the civil rights movement beyond Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but she doesn't share the same recognition as he does. As a black woman born in Mississippi in 1917, she came into engaging the racial and economic injustice in the U.S. because she simply said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Reverend Harris, would you please share with us, how do you see and have experienced Ms. Hamer as a peacemaker? Well, thank you, Doctor, for having me on your show. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the uh, critical things uh, is history right now, that we must teach history. Uh, I think history right now is watered down uh, uh, by a lot of America. Uh, I think Fannie Lou Hamer, as I listened to her speech at the Democratic Convention, uh, it was very profound what she said and what she experienced here in America. I think a lot of our women, our uh, women like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Shirley Chisholm, uh, Rosa Parks, many, many women who do not uh, share that recognition as Dr. King, not to take nothing away from Dr. King, but we, we believe that, that women are the key uh, to the kingdom. We believe that, that had not been for the women, it would not be no me. And so I think that uh, we have not uh, uh, given our women the uh, due process and the recognition that they deserve as Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, it seems that uh, every year uh, when black history roll around, uh, 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 don't take me wrong, uh, Dr. King has done a lot and he deserve all the credit, but he wasn't the only one in the civil rights movement uh, that has uh, bled, uh, got beat, stabbed, uh, wounded, uh, dogs, canine dogs uh, put on him, uh, called the N-word, many, many others. And, and I think that we have to do a better job uh, uh, in our educational systems, uh, even in our institution, our churches. And, and that's one thing that I like about our church, New Life, New Life Church of God. My senior pastor, Paul McCoy, has allowed us to integrate uh, our black history into our sermons when we teach on Sunday morning. Uh, it's not uh, uh, surprising to come into our sanctuary, and I'm showing a movie of Dr. King uh, in the middle of September mm -hmm. or in the middle of August because I feel that black history needs to be taught year-round. It's not just a February, January type of uh, teaching, but it's a 12 months, 365 days, seven days a week, 24 hours a day of history that we need to teach ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, many other uh, folks like her, uh, we need to teach our young women. Our young women today uh, do not know their history of their ancestors uh, like her uh, and many like her who has done a lot in this country. And I think that we have to do a better job at that. Yes, and looking at the various ways that other people beyond King who experienced the brutality, the hatred, and the violence, women and children put their lives on the lines, uh, Christians and non-Christians. But one of the things that I want to bring us back to as peacemakers as we look at the role that King played as well. Like him, you are a minister, a community organizer, a civil and human rights organizer. What has been your most challenging experience in trying to engage Christians in peacemaking and nonviolence? And King had a difficult time as well in that area. Over 50 years ago, there were some of his brother pastors who thought he was out of line. Right. Don't Trouble the waters. Right. What has been your experience and challenge in peacemaking and trying to engage uh, Christians in that I, I, I think for, as a minister, I think a lot of things play against me. One, I'm young. Uh, two, uh, some, some uh, ministers may say, well, you don't, you don't have enough education to be speaking towards the issue. Uh, I think that a lot of it has to do with common sense. I think that when you look at the history of Dr. King, you'll find out his biggest opposition was ministers. Uh, his biggest opposition was being criticized by pastors going into cities uh, uh, to seek for justice and to stand for people uh, that was being messed over. I think that King, uh, when he went to jail, uh, he wrote the letter to those ministers uh, saying that, you know, I was called into this community uh, to stand. I'm doing the work that you're supposed to be doing, but yet you criticized me and called me a troublemaker. So I think today I, I, I experienced the same type of... Uh, experiences with, with, with some of our ministers, local ministers, national ministers. 
I think that um, um, it's a lack of education. It's a comfort that to uh, be able to uh, be on the sideline, the neutral zone, not to be able to be a thermostat for change. Uh, and so I think that when, when I look at King and many like King, I think that, that we have to position ourselves uh, to be able to take those hits because this is all political, like it or not. This is political because the politicians is, is the one who King uh, was going up against in the system to change policy. If we remember that uh, black folks didn't have the right to vote in this country at one time. It wasn't until 63, 64 when Lyndon Johnson signed the bill. So, I mean, we've been enslaved over 400 years in this country. And some today uh, say, you know, just because we don't see colors uh, uh, sign up on the, uh, uh, over the uh, water fountain or we don't see uh, 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 bathrooms just for whites or, uh, integrate, you know, now we have lunch counters that's integrated and what have you doesn't mean that there's not a race problem in America. We still have a problem in America. And, and so, you know, I have to challenge, you know, my brothers, uh, my white brothers, black brothers, that, you know, it's, you have to stand for right. You just cannot keep going along with the flow. When I look at the uh, MLK march that goes on here in this city, when I look at how uh, uh, people show up every year in the name of Dr. King, but at the same time, we don't see these people until the next year, right? So we have homeless people being messed over in this community. We have police brutality that's, that's happening in this community. King, you know, stood against poverty. Uh, and so these are the type of issues, you know, education is, is, is we don't even have a black principal nowhere in Fresno County. Uh, Fresno Unified is the third largest school district in California. We don't even have a black principal. So just that alone tells you that there's a problem, but yet, Who's speaking to that issue? Where's our political, where's our minister speaking to that issue from the north end of town, from the south end, from the east end of town? So you're saying that uh, ministers, from your experience, want to just sit on the sideline and be comfortable and don't, don't seem to have the courage to engage, as what we were sharing earlier from the show. Yes. And so as we go back to King increasing the temperature towards the end of his life, if he was naming the ways that the church and ministers need to be more courageous. He was standing alone too as he gave his address in the Riverside Church, April 4th, 1967, one year to the date of his assassination that occurred in 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. But in New York on April 4th, 1967, as he was sharing his address on the Vietnam War. And the title of his address was Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. He stated, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Brinsinger. What do you think of King's assessment of the U.S. Uh, of saying that the greatest purveyor of violence is the United States. I, I don't have empirical evidence t to know specifically, but I don't doubt it. Um, locally and in various countries where I've been, the, either the direct or secondary effects of a lot of our policies and things have consequences that the average American wouldn't have a clue about. So. I don't, I don't doubt the veracity of that. I think that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Reverend Harris, do you care to respond to that question? What do you think of King's assessment of this country? As of today? Then and today, whatever you want to share. I believe he's turning over in his grave right now, very upset for how this country has went against the principles of what he stood for and died for uh, for people. And I think the, the amount of resources right now that's being shed in, in other countries and to see our people suffer here, uh, I believe that he's, he's very, very uh, in discomfort right now. Uh, and not to see the ministers uh, uh, that claim to stand for Christianity and what other religion marching in his name, I believe he's very upset. So in light of uh, Dr. Brinsinger indicated that, wow, what would be the empirical evidence that we would need to show uh, 
this is really happening so that people as Christians, we could be aware of our response. Reverend Harris, you shared earlier as far as within the city, we lack African-American leadership in schools. And even though African-Americans are a smaller percentage of the city at a 4%, but not one African-American uh, principal in high school, there are a couple in elementary schools. And so what are some of the other things that you have experienced, both of you could share within Fresno from your own personal observations that would sort of lend credence to what King has shared? Let me just qualify quickly. Okay. I, I didn't want to say there wasn't empirical evidence for the... Um, no, you said you didn't know. I just wouldn't know how to qualify right. which is first, second, or third. Oh, okay. Thank but you. But there's plenty of empirical evidence about the, the violence created by our government locally and globally. Yeah. So is there anything you would like to identify from your own personal observations that you have experienced? Having children in uh, foreign countries hold shell casings that say, say May in the U made in the USA in my face, uh, ad infinitum, just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Reverend Harris, anything you would like to share on your experience on the empirical, um, empirical observations that you have had concerning how the U.S. has been a perpetrator of violence? Well, I, I, I would just say that, that economically our, our, our the money flow uh, is not for American people. And, and it seems that we take care of other countries, I'm not saying we should not, but I think we should have a balance with it, you know, even with 9-11 to see the amount of money that's being spent uh, on war. You know, when we have people here don't have housing, don't have a place to live, food to eat. We have folks now who's just on parole or probation cannot receive food stamps. I mean, so what, what do this America, you know, what do people supposed to do? I mean, these are things that King uh, stood for, you know, equality. What does the word equality mean here in America? What does the United States flag mean anymore when we put our hand over our heart and pl pledge allegiance to it when it says uh, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Well, who's receiving the justice? Because when we look at the prison industry, it's African Americans who is the highest populated in, in the prison industry. So uh, we, we, we have some problems that we really need to come around the table and talk about it, not just as black people, but all people from all four corners of Fresno. As you shared that, one of the things that came to mind is the statement, the biblical passage that came, opened us up, Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God, which transcends any particular national identity, but also expresses their love for the particular national um, land that they're part of. So it's both inclusive yet transcending as I see Jesus calling us to be in the world as we care for where we are, but yet knowing that we are so much more um, and loving all our sisters and brothers. I want to thank my guests, Dr. Terry Brinsinger and Reverend Dr. Floyd Harris for sharing their insights on today's program. Remember, if you miss any part of the show, you can always view it again online. Just visit our website at knxt.tv and follow the Perspectives link. I'm Karen Crozier. Thank you for joining me today on Perspectives on Faith and Culture. God bless.